In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to spend this time of prayer fruitfully. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. The mystery that we are celebrating today is supernaturally revealed in the sacred texts, texts that constitute the liturgy of the word of today's Mass. <clears throat> the first reading taken from the Acts of the Apostles begins and situates the account. When Saint Luke, addressing an imaginary Theophilus, would say in the first book, O Theophilus, I dealt with all that Jesus did and taught until the day he was taken up. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While meeting with them, he enjoined them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, about which you have heard me speak. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In these past weeks since Easter, we had been reliving those days described by St. Luke. When the resurrected Christ spent a lot of time with his closest disciples, later on to be called apostles. First in the upper room, starting on the very evening of Easter, Sunday, and a week thereafter in Galilee where he had confirmed Peter in the primacy, and then back in Jerusalem. He opened their minds and hearts. It says, in multis argumentis, with a lot of discourse to the mysteries in sacred scripture and about the events of the past days. We too have gone over the words of our Lord in the Last Supper, relived those days in Galilee and allowed our hearts to be moved to renewed desires for holiness and apostolate. Now we gather with them around our Lord in one final, shall we say, gesture that sealed their faith as it should seal ours. And St. Luke continues. When they had gathered, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he answered them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has established by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Lord, is it now that you will restore the kingdom of Israel? How human their schemes is still were those dear disciples of Jesus, even that late in the game, our Lord already was ascending to heaven and was going to commission them to the apostles to preach and to baptize and to lead the flock. And still they were there with their, shall we say, earthly schemes. Is it any surprise then that up to our time, after two millennia, my Lord, that there are still people who envision an earthly paradise with their false theology of liberation or even delusions of a Catholic vote. Did you not openly declare, my Lord, even at the moment of judgment and condemnation by that political appointee pilot, my kingdom is not of this world? Indeed, how could Pilate have understood that when even the soon-to-be apostles did not? How can an ordinary man and woman really take it to heart when theologians in supposedly Catholic institutions keep on teaching a theology of liberation that wants to establish 
the perfect order now. My kingdom is not of this world, our Lord said. And yet, my Lord, did you not also say that renium de intra vos est, that the kingdom of God is within you? My kingdom is not of this world. And then the kingdom of God is within you. The first is a negation of the utopian idea of an earthly paradise. But the second is an affirmation of the ideal of a heavenly existence by the disciples of Jesus Christ. The first is a denial of the possibility of a perfect temporal order. My kingdom is not of this world. While the second is an invitation to the ideal of moral union with God by the individual person. The Pascal mystery, with its culmination in the mystery that we're celebrating today, is the guarantee of the resolution of that apparent contradiction. Despite the imperfection of this world, that had come out perfect from the hands of God, but had been uglified, distorted by men's wrong use of his freedom, that it is possible to live in a heavenly way, in a morally upright way, with the trajectory going towards heaven. But this is the point. It is something very personal, individual. It's not a question of classes struggle. It's not a, class, a lesson of changing political dynasties. It's not even a, a, a question of electing the right president or the right senators. It's that. That's not what's going to establish the kingdom of God amongst us. Because the kingdom of God reigns in the individual hearts and minds of men. What has to be converted are individual persons. And by dint of the conversion of individual persons, then perhaps the structures can also be changed. To the extent that the individual man and woman lives his life according to the will of God, then he becomes an instrument in God's hands to renew this world that has been made ugly by sin. That's why I never believed in movements, mass movements, in, I don't know, Edsa revolutions or other kinds of revolutions in Pasig or in Makati, for that matter. I never really felt comfortable with the notion of a pink wave. This world is not going to change with waves, not even tidal waves. What will change are individual men and women. And since individual men and women cannot be changed in such massive scale overnight, then the idea or the thought I call it a delusion of a utopia in this world will remain always as a chimera, a mirage, an illusion, which people will waste their time on, waste energies, excitement, emotions, thereby going on a roller coaster ride emotionally. I there are still people who are smarting from the results of the recent elections in the Philippines, and they're there retreating back to their ivory towers or uh, just um, doing something else. Eating, drinking, and marrying, merrymaking, because tomorrow we die. Ascendi Deus in you below, et Dominus in voce tube. God ascends amid shouts of joy, a blare of trumpet for the Lord. The responsorial psalm is a heartfelt cry of the soul in love with God, who longs to see his mark on his creation. It is the resolution of the seeming contradiction between Christ's two affirmations that we have just stated. My kingdom is not of this world, but on the other hand, that the kingdom of God is within you. I had to look very deep into the um, Latin, renium de intra vos est. Intra vos est, not inter vos est. 
to decide whether the translation would be the kingdom of God is amongst you or among you or precisely the kingdom of God is within you. Within you, gotta be within the crowd. But it has to be within the individual person. God does not save collectivities. Yes, he wants to save everyone. But the will of God is that everyone be saved. But alas, we remain free and human freedom demands individual responses personal responses, not the response of, of everyone collectively. This was already implied by Pope Francis in the Evangelic Gaudium when he lamented that the evil spirit of defeatism is brother to the temptation to separate the wheat from the weeds before its time. It's the fruit of an anxious and self-centered lack of trust. Let's go deep into those words of the vicar of Christ. The evil spirit of defeatism, pessimism, is brother. In other words, is related to, is, is the flip side of the coin, even, to the temptation to separate the wheat from the weeds before its time. That utopian ideal of the theology of liberation. It is the fruit of an anxious and self-centered lack of trust. The temporal order, the temporal order, may never perfectly reflect the eternal law of God, despite all the utopian ideals preached by the false prophets of the theology of liberation. It is futile to prematurely separate the wheat from the wheat, the grain from the chaff, this was what Jesus was teaching his disciples in the conclusion of the parable of the wheat amongst the wheat. When the landowner forbade his servants from uprooting the weeds immediately, with the danger of uprooting the wheat as well. Rather, he told them to let the two grow together until harvest time. Then the ears of wheat could be bundled and stored in the barn, while the weeds could also be bundled and thrown into the fire. Finally, this was what Jesus meant when he said that his kingdom is not of this world, which was tantamount to saying that his is not a worldly kingdom. Rather, the kingdom of God is within us when we individually and personally allow the Blessed Trinity to reign in our minds and hearts. When we confirm our soul to that kingship, despite all the contrarieties in our environment, Happy indeed is the man, as Jesus declared in the Sermon on the Mount, who mourns. The man who knows how to make an interior moral uprightness be the guiding force to steer him through the ethical morass that his environment may present. Suffering in the process, the way our Lord, who is the only innocent one, suffered and died for all of us who are the guilty ones. Nevertheless, in no way does this mean that evil will just reign supreme and we can just give up in this world. And this is the message of the second reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Christ did not enter into sanctuaries as made by hands, a copy of the true one, but heaven itself, that he might not appear before, rather he may now appear before God on our behalf. And now once for all, he has appeared at the end of the ages to take away sin by his sacrifice. But just as it is, it is appointed that men and women die once, and after this the judgment, so also Christ offered once to take away the sins of many. And under, I underline that of many will appear a second time, not to take away sin, but to bring salvation to those who eagerly await him. Many, those who eagerly await him, not all, unfortunately. Not to take away sin, but to bring salvation to those who eagerly await him. These words of the author of the letter to the Hebrews should take away not only any defeatism, 
as Pope France, Francis would call it, but also an attempt, any attempt at utopianism that pretends to establish an earthly or even worldly heaven. As the same author to the Hebrews exclaims, Christ offered himself once to take away the sins of many, not all. At the most recent reform of the English translation of the Roman Missal would emphasize in the words of consecration, the consecration of the wine to the blood of Christ, where it says, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. For decades, the translation there was, in English, was, um, which will be poured out for all, a departure from the official original Latin text of the Novus Order of the Second Vatican Council that precisely said, Provobis et promultis, promultis, not for only. Multis, many, but not all. This was one of the most brazen mis mistranslations of the official Latin text of the Roman Missal of the Second Vatican Council's Novus Ordo to the vernacular English, that is. Part of the liturgical abuses of the post-conciliar crisis, which was happily corrected during the papacy of Benedict XVI, who was, of course, a liturgist and a Latinist. Salvation is individual, not collective, and sanctification is very personal. It requires an individual and personal correspondence by the human person, the individual human person, to the equally specific and personal invitation of God. Be holy, because I am holy. This is the great message of our Lord's ascension. As the second reading concludes, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since through the blood of Jesus we have confidence of entrance into the sanctuary by the new and living way he opened for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a sincere heart and in absolute trust, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold unwaveringly to our confession that gives us hope, for he who made the promise is, is trustworthy. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Christ's ascension into heaven signifies his participation and his humanity in God's power and authority. Jesus Christ is Lord. He possesses all power in heaven and on earth. He is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. For the Father has put all things under his feet. Christ is Lord of the cosmos and of history. In him, human history and indeed all creation are set forth and transcendently fulfilled. My brothers and sisters, our Lord's ascension is at the same time the seal of our salvation and a foretaste of our eternal life. Again, the words of the Catechism are clear and encouraging. Since the ascension, it says, God's plan has entered its fulfillment. We are already at the last hour. Already the final age of the world is with us, and the renewal of the world is irrevocably underway. It is even now anticipated in a certain real way, for the church on earth is endowed already with a sanctity that is real, albeit imperfect. Christ's kingdom already manifests its presence through the miraculous signs that attend its proclamation by the church. This is the message of the Lord's Ascension. It's a message of hope, but it is also a mandate for the Christian apostolate. Let's not forget 
what our Lord said to his disciples, and we were just meditating on it yesterday and the day before as he ascended to heaven. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you until the end of the earth. Go and make disciples of all nations. Preach. That's the task of the church, to teach. And we are the church. And how are we going to teach? Not by going around preaching, unless you're a preacher, a priest, that is. But with your lives, with your example, with your friendship, with the solutions that you give to the, to the problems of this society. Not in a utopic way, but in a very practical way changing minds and hearts of the people around you. Not the whole republic, for not to say the whole world, collectively. That's the kind of wishful thinking that people fall into and then get paralyzed, daunted, as it were, by the um, size of the task. But if you start thinking in practical terms, the people around you in your home, your spouse, your children, your domestic staff, the example that you can give them, the encouragement that you can give them. And why not say it? Because of the community of, of the saints, because we're all interconnected spiritually, because of the pull towards above that you give them with your own sanctity, with your own struggle. That's what to preach means with our lives baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You're not going to go around baptizing people. That's a task for the hierarchy. Remember, our Lord, when he made that commission, he wasn't speaking to a multitude. He was speaking to the apostles. He go and preach to all nations. But we participate in that mission. And we participate because we're members of the church. We're the mystical body of Christ. And so in the same way that priests are authorized to preach officially, authoritatively, we are authorized, quote-unquote, to preach with our lives, to spread the good news, or even to resolve doctrinal issues to the extent that we are formed. We give the right answers, the right resolutions to the problems of this world. That's what the core means, as we were meditating on yesterday. But we also baptize. We also sanctify. No, definitely, we're not the ministers of the sacraments. The only exception would be baptism in an unusual situation because anyone can baptize. Or in the case of marriage, because the two spouses are the ministers of their own marriage. They marry each other. They confection the sacrament between the two of them. The priest, the sacred minister, is just a witness. A qualified witness, definitely, but a witness, nevertheless. The ministers of marriage are the spouses. But to a larger extent, we are channels of God's grace because of our priestly soul, because of our identification with Jesus Christ, the priest. When we put the imprint of God in the temporal realities that we are in or involved in, and then having purified, sanctified it, offer it like incense, an odorum sovietatis, rising up to heaven. That's our priestly task, our priestly role. And behold, I'm with you to the end of time. That's why we get involved in politics. Well, you, that is, not me. I'm a priest. Priests should never get involved in partisan politics. They should speak about principles. I've been insisting on this point from the beginning of the political exercise. If you layman do your stuff, do your job, then you will be not only involved in politics, but in the corporate world, and you will be leading this world where it should go. What did St. Paul say? That the world is groaning, the universe is groaning for the revelation of the children of God. That this world, this universe, this structures seem without direction without a captain, so to speak, until the children of God 
becomes all the light. And with this, we shall end with the gospel reading. Jesus said to his disciples, Behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. He was referring to the coming Holy Spirit, which we will celebrate next week. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, raised his hands and blessed them. And as he blessed them, he departed from them and was taken up to heaven. And they did him homage and then returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple praising God. We have to end. We're drawing to a close this great season of Lent and Easter. Hopefully, if we had done what we were supposed to do, if you had done what I had been encouraging you to do from the very beginning of crossing the desert, the beginning of Lent, all throughout Lent, and these halcyon days of Easter, up to today and up to next week, then we should have been renewed. We should have come up with resolutions. But if still we haven't, then now is the time. You have a few minutes left to concretize your resolutions and end this prayer. Thank you.